Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya wal mursalin sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah uh, welcome back to our kuliah Zuhur uh, post month of Ramadan and Shawwal. So as we've indicated last week uh, for this time all the way until December insyaallah for Wednesday at least we'll be talking on the topic of Ashara Mubashara or the 10 who were promised paradise. And so if you recall last week we spoke about the uh, the list based on a couple of authenticated hadith of those 10 who were promised paradise. And we launched in the conversations with regards to Sayyidina Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu. So as a short recap and then we move on uh, to the rest of his history. Um, we know that he is two years younger than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and being two years younger and if you, if, you read, if you know his history, he also moved on two years later. So while the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed at the age of 63 years old, so did Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu an. Right? Um, so he was also from uh, Banu Quraysh uh, in, in the tribe of Banu uh, Tamim. Um, his real name really is not Abu Bakr but it's really Abdullah ibn Uthman. His father's name is Uthman and his name is Abdullah. Uh, but just like any of um, the Arabs at that time, they were usually known by their pen names. Uh, another example would be if, let's say, uh, my name is Safur Rahman. Before I'm married, I would call it Safur Rahman. But let's say I have a son and my son is called Ali. And after the birth of my son, I'll be known as Abu Ali, right? the father of Ali. So that's how the culture of the Arabs at that time. So, um, as you probably know, uh, another, another example, uh, Imam Al-Ghazali, Imam Al-Nawawi, those are all not the real names. Those are the names of where they come from. Okay, so, um, we spoke last week about this very uh, beautiful character and personality. And the reason why we learn about these 10 companions is because if uh, there is authenticated uh, hadith, and many, they were, there are many with regards to these 10 who are promised paradise. And inshallah, if we can try to emulate the examples maybe, whether it is be with regards to their ibadah, or maybe it's because of their morality, or maybe it's because of their maybe leadership or loyalty, then inshallah, we can at least be nearer to Jannah. Right? So one of the things about being a good friend, and Sayyidina Abu Bakr is in reality something like the BFF of Rasulullah Wasallam. So he was the first man who embraced Islam, and uh, the first youth is an Ali, and the first female is uh, Sayyidatina Khadija. Right? And the, the story in which this came about is really, really beautiful. It exemplifies what it means to be a good, true, loyal friend. So when the Prophet ﷺ disclosed to him about Islam and how he was, uh, you know, he was appointed by Allah and how he, uh, Jibreel ﷺ came to him, he accepted it immediately. Right? Unlike any others, he accepted it immediately. So the Prophet ﷺ said, when I invited people towards Allah, everybody thought over it and hesitated, at least for a while, except Abu Bakr, who accepted my call the moment I put it before him, and he did not hesitate even for a moment. Now, these big decisions in life, is not about uh, let's go for dinner and then let's go. It's about changing a whole lifestyle, changing, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, religion. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a heavy kind of a decision, but because of his trust, uh, with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the moment Rasulullah invited him, he said, "Okay, fine, I'm sold. What do I need to do?" Right? And perhaps because of that conviction, perhaps because of that loyalty, perhaps because of that trust that he has in the man of God, that inshallah, uh, you know, if we can do that the same to our friends, you know, maybe we could be uh, one of the candidates of Jannah, inshallah. Wallahu alam. Right? Because this is one of the characteristics of Sayyidina Abu Bakr. And so, um, we spoke about this last week also before we ended uh, at 2 o'clock, that out of the 10 who were promised paradise, 7 of those came to Islam through the hands of Sayyidina Abu Bakr. I mean, imagine, if 10 promised paradise, 7 are going to paradise because of the conversion through Sayyidina Abu Bakr, where do you think Sayyidina Abu Bakr will be? I mean, dia yang bawa orang <laughs> masuk Islam, dan orang ni, yang tujuh daripada sepuluh ni, akan masuk Jannah. So, where do you think he will be? Okay, inshallah, it's in Jannah. So that would be one of the things that maybe if you think about how have I explained Islam, how have I shown my faith to others in, my, in, in the office maybe. It's not about, you know, it's not about giving a debate. <laughs> Nowadays, Muslims like to debate. Eh? In the end, we don't know much and then we talk a lot. 
Uh, it's not about argument who is right and who is wrong. It is about how you behave as a Muslim. And a very simple methodology maybe at work simply is this. To be industrious in what you do, to be amana in whatever you are given, the task. If the job asks you to be there by 8, you are there at 7.45 to get ready and 8 o'clock pump because I'm going to earn halal sustenance. And then if lunchtime, 1 to 2, 2 o'clock, you're back in the office. And nothing earlier, simple stuff like that. This brings barakah. Right? You, make, you make your earnings at the end of the month halal, inshallah. Right? Uh, if you're given a task, do it properly, the best that you can. It may not be perfect, but it's the best that you can. At least when you, at, the, at the end of the day, when you sit down, your conscience tells you, I've done what I can do. There's nothing more I can do with this. And that is what it means to be a Muslim. Right? And you know, if, you, if you all behave in this way, in the morning, especially when you want to Monday, macam tak nak pergi kerja, tapi kena pergi kerja. And then, you know, people say good morning, say, yeah, good morning. Why not we say good morning first? Why must we only say Assalamualaikum to the Muslims and then the non-Muslims just like, ah, tak payah lah, dia bukan Muslim. Cannot. Assalamualaikum, and then in, to the others, good morning, how are you? With a smile. My, my, sometimes my experience, and I think you will agree with me, the problem with Muslims generally is this, eh? kita macam action serious je, tak pernah senyum. Padahal senyum is a sadaqah. Right? So smile and say good morning and you know one of the things that you know is you can do easily is you know every office at a cleaner, say hi, buy her coffee, kesian, macam itu. Wash your toilet, clean your table. And these are the ways that will make you stand out in terms of behaviour as a Muslim. Not to show off, but taking these opportunities to really practice your faith. And when people start to see all of this happening and they start to see all the Muslims are doing this, then they say something is right with this religion. It's not like what I see in the news. It's not what I hear in the paper, you know, in, 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 uh, through other people. Because the Muslims in my company, they all are very good. They are polite. They buy me coffee. And although they have cleaner, tapi they jaga tempat dia bersih. So these are the kind of characteristics that we need to embody. And maybe through that, we become better human beings. We become better Muslims. And inshallah, we will follow the example of Sanar Bakar radiallahu an. Okay? So uh, that we talked about last week. <coughs> and so to today, we are going to continue uh, touching on the title in which he was given, As-Siddiq. As-Siddiq can be translated as the truthful one or the one who verifies the truthfulness of something. Right? So either the truthful one, which is the most common because probably it's shorter to explain, but really what he did to attain this was he verified the truthfulness of something. And this is in the story of Isra wal Mi'raj. And so we know the story in detail. I'm not going to go through that because that's not the, the, the main emphasis of this uh, topic. But while Hasil, after the Prophet وسلم, came back from Isra and Miraj, the first thing he, he had in mind was, I, need, you know, I want to tell someone. And instead of telling anyone else, so at that time, Abu Bakr, Umar, Ali, Uthman, all didn't know about this, he decided to break the news to his family first. So he gathered everyone else. And you know, last time, kita dorang di rumah, tak ada macam conference room, so they have to go outside. And so he said, oh, my family members, if I were to tell you, just to test water, if I were to tell you, behind this hill, an enemy is coming to attack all of us, would you believe me? And they said, of course, you're Muhammad, the Alameen. Right? We will believe you, whatever you say, it should be true. So let me then narrate to you what happened to me yesterday night. So they, they cerita kan lah, from uh, uh, Masjid Al-Haram to Batu Maqdis, and then Batu Maqdis all the way to the seven heavens, and then come back within a couple of hours. The moment he said, he said this, of course, uh, his family members, uh, they said, okay, uh, Ya Muhammad, not only are you uh, a magician, can, you know, the Prophet has been accused to be a magician, you're also getting crazy. Uh, telling me of this story, which is impossible. How can one go to, from uh, Mecca to Baitul Maqdis and then up and down all the way within a couple of hours? And so, I mean, but then now we know it's not impossible. Because eh? I remember when I go for my studies uh, to the US, I left on Friday, 7 a.m., Singapore Changi Airport. I reached uh, reach, uh, Seattle at Friday, same date, 9 a.m., two hours here <laughs> because of the time difference. So anyway, it's not impossible. If Allah wants it, it will, whatever can happen. So coincidentally, a caravan passed by and they just came back from Batul Maqdis. And so uh, Abu Jahal said, hey, you know, you just came back from Batul Maqdis. Uh, can you just hold on a minute to clarify something? And so he asked the Prophet to describe something in Batul Maqdis because Abu Jahal have not been to, to, to Batul Maqdis. 
And so the Prophet described in great detail the environment, the area, and he was describing Masjid Al-Aqsa, and he was describing even the door in Masjid, Masjid Al-Aqsa. Kita datang sini every week, every day, we can't even describe the door. I also forgot how many doors he has. One, two, three, four, five, six, six, just in case next time. <laughs> okay, he described the, the ornaments, the carvings, and then when Abu Jahal said, is that correct? To the caravan that just came back, they said, yeah, exactly, that was correct. That's what exactly we saw. So the proof was there. But because, you know, uh, the heart, that's a disease. Uh, the heart refused to accept, so Abu Jahal just walked away. And when he walked away, and remember, Sayyidina Abu Bakar didn't know about this story, he walked away and he saw Abu Bakar and he said, yeah, Abu Bakar, you know what your friend has been saying? And then he explained what the friend has been saying. Do you believe him? Now, okay, this is a test. This is a test for all of us. M my question is, if somebody tells about our best friend saying ABC, and our friend haven't told us about this ABC, would you believe him? And this story is really out of this world, literally out of this world. Here, to there, there, to up. Last time, tak ada kapal terbang. And then, when Abu Jahal told him, Sayyidina Abu Bakar said, well, if that is what he said, then it must be true. Didn't you all call him Al-Amin? <laughs> Remember about the, the enemy coming behind him? Didn't you all testify that if he says anything, it will be true? And then now when he tells you this, you don't accept it. So he said, if the Prophet said this, then it must be true. This is a mark of a true friend. This is a mark of a great friend. Right? And that's why Abu Bakar is the 10 promised paradise. Maybe this is one thing that we need to acquire in all of us, the trust. And then Abu Jahal said, how, how can you believe such nonsense, basically? How can you believe such nonsense? It's like ridiculous for someone to travel in this way in such a short period of time. And then he said, because I've been told about things more miraculous than this. The Prophet has told us about Jannah and has told us about Hellfire. So obviously, this small thing he traveled, I would believe. It's no big deal. And because of that, when later on, the Prophet then met him and told him about the thing and he was told about what happened, then the Prophet gave him the title of as siddiq the one who verifies the truth. Even he himself doesn't know yet at that point. So this is a mark that has been lacking in most of us in these times. And one of the most important things that the Prophet used to say that in this life, we have two vis advisors, wazirs, or ministers. And the Prophet had two from the heavens and two from the earth. The two from heavens are Sayyidina Jibril and Mikhail. And of course, you and I will never have that, so never mind. Put that aside. But the two advisors from earth are Abu Bakr and Umar. Right? So, basically, in our common terms, is, this is his ad trusted friend, advisor, the BFF. Right, the best friends. And so, as a child, as a young boy, this struck me very deeply because then I asked myself, and maybe this is a good exercise for us to ask ourselves, do we have an Abu Bakr and an Umar in our life? Who would be able to verify like what Abu Bakr did to the Prophet And if the answer is yes, Alhamdulillah. But what if the answer is no? Tak ada pun kawan setia begitu. Kalau tak ada, the proposal from me is this. Don't look for one. The, the suggestion is, become one. Become an Abu Bakr and become an Umar to the friend that you trust and to the friend that you love. And then Allah will send Abu Bakr and Umar in your life, inshallah. So this is very important, um, at least for me. And so the next thing I want to talk about, Sana Abu Bakr, was with regards to Hijrah. Unlike the other four Khulafa al-Rashidin, they were not mentioned. And although Abu Bakr was not mentioned by name, he was alluded to by the company that he kept with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And here, um, I just recite the uh, translation for expediency. In Surah at tawbah Allah said, and you remember this is when they were running away, uh, they were performing the hijrah, and then they were en the enemies of the Quraysh were trying to attack them. So while Medina was on uh, south, roughly, so in order to like, um, uh, confuse the enemy, they keep, they hide and they went on to the west. Right? So it's uh, at Mount Tur. So that's when the Quran, this is verse called at Tur. So in that, mount, in that cave, they stayed for three days and three nights. And as you probably would know, in Islamic spirituality, that's probably one of the very important lesson because in there, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sunan Bakar performed a suluk. And of course, in three days, so that's where the Prophet gave him a lot of uh, you know, lessons and secrets in a sense. 
And you also probably know the story when there was a cobra that came and then, you know, the prophet was sleeping on the lap of Sanar Bakar and then the cobra beat, uh, poisoned his leg. And deer still didn't wake up. He still didn't move because the prophet was sleeping. He wanted to respect the prophet. And then Sampai the Menangis, I mean, a, a, a strong big man was crying because it was so painful. And then the, the teardrop fell on the prophet's face and the prophet thought it was raining. And so when the prophet woke up and said, you know, what happened? And he said, oh, uh, you know, a huge snake uh, beat me. And so, subhanAllah, and the prophet take his uh, saliva and he said, bismillah, and then just wipe on the feet and it's fine. We are talking about a cobra <laughs> that you can die within minutes, right? And then you remember in another, in another, in another um, a battle when the Prophet ﷺ wanted to give the banner, the, the flag to Sana Ali, Karam Allah and then and on that night he did tengah sakit mata mira, dah tak nampak. And the Prophet said, tomorrow I will announce who will be the flag bearer. And everybody wanted to be the flag bearer. And, and, and Sana Ali said, okay lah, I got no chance lah because mata dah sakit mata mira, then I cannot see properly. So tak apalah, I become normal uh, soldier. And the next day, the Prophet said the flag bearer for this battle will be Sana Ali. And the Prophet, same, take the saliva, Bismillah, and then Anu Kamata, habis. Dah baik. You know, so same Bismillah that you know, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, pap, taruh. Yeah, another thing, I was th- I'm, my, my class on Tafsir is on Monday, and we were doing Suratul Fatiha. And then, you know, Surah, Suratul Fatiha, you know, we read every day, at least 17 times a day. The same verse that was revealed 1400 years ago to the same, you know, to the Prophet and to the companion. So one day, a tra- a, a, a gr- the group of companions went, you know, they were walking home and then they, they ran out of food and drinks. So they passed by a tribe and they said, we are hungry, we are thirsty, can you uh, give us some food? And then your tribe located scared. They said, no, I, c- I, I can't, please go away. And then suddenly, when they were walking away, a scorpion stung the tribe chief. A scorpion, no, bukan N, bukan apa-apa, no, scorpion. Yang, again, in another few minutes, she should die. And so they don't know what to do. And, 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 and they, they, she ran, the daughter ran and asked these uh, companions, like, hey, no, my father just got stung by a scorpion. I don't know what to do. Does any one of you know what, know what to do? If I ask you, I, I can have bitten a scorpion. You know what to do? The most you call 99911. By the time the ambulance comes, <laughs> in Alila, finish. Right? So the companions went. Yeah. Although, remember, tak kasi makan, eh? the companions went. And then, with a couple of minutes, maybe 10 minutes, he came back and then the, the chief, bangun dah okay. And then, <laughs> the kawan-kawan like, eh, ap- apa kau buat? <laughs> apa yang kau baca dengan dia? Apa jambi-jampinya? Like, Nothing lah. I just said Surah Al-Fatihah. Because Surah Al-Fatihah is also known as ar ruqya Ash-Shifa, As-Salah. Right? These are the many names of uh, Surah Al-Fatihah. So, it takes the characteristic. So, I just said Surah Al-Fatihah and then I wipe on him and then clear. And because of this, they gave him now 30 kambing to bring home. And so this, the companion said, okay, let's go back. Don't touch the kambing. Let's ask the prophet whether this is correct. Maybe, maybe jangan menjadi macam magic ke bomo ke whatever kan. So when you see the prophet, the prophet, betul tak kita buat ni? Kita baca fatiha and then dah baik. Then the prophet said, it's true. And that's why surah fatiha is known as aruk ya. And then the prophet said, you have 30 sheep. One sheep now belongs to me. 29 you can divide by yourself. Right? So... My, my, my thinking and the, the way it makes me question is this. The same Bismillah, the same Fatiha revealed then and we are still reading it even just now, tapi the impact different. Kalau macam sakit kan, kita baca lah, with the barakah, suratul Fatiha, walad dalin, amin, huh, minum, tak baik-baik pun. That one kena serang dengan scorpion, immediately baik. So it, 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 it occurs to me that while the verses are the same, faith, and the conviction, keyakinan, atau the heart is not the same. They were reading the same verse. They were praying the same prayer. Tapi lepas the companion sahabat, Ya subhanallah, saya nak Ali karamallahu wa shah. Just kita berbual sikit-sikit lah. Uh, we, we just stop here for today. Uh, saya nak Ali karamallahu wa shah. One day was praying at his home. Tengah semayang macam kita semayang zuhur tadi, Allahu Akbar. Rumah dia terbakar. Rumah dia terbakar. Orang kecoh kat belakang. Eh, Ali, Ali, keluar, keluar. Rumah terbakar, rumah terbakar. Get out. And he didn't move. And then after that, he, he finished his salah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Then, they, eh, rumah aku terbakar. Dia tak sadar. This is the kind of khusyuk 
and that the companions have in their salah, and that's why that becomes the co- intimate conversation they have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why. And there's one companion who was doing holding a fort during the battle, and then he was praying, he was praying, and then while he's praying, the archer uh, panah dia kena kaki dia, dua tiga dah. Then he continued praying. Kalau I kena panah satu terus dah pingsan, terus saya batalkan sembahyang terus dah pingsan. Dia continue to pray, and then he came to his mind, eh eh, kalau I did not tell the prophet about this, he might die. Because of that reason alone, then he batalkan dia salah. I mean, there are many many stories, but these are some of the examples of the difference. The same thing. Fatiha ke, Bismillah ke, Salah ke, but the impact is different because of the quality of the heart that we bring, because of the conviction of how we commit our perform our prayers, for example, and how we read the Quran, for example. Do you know, like when you go for operation, and in Singapore like this, eh, kalau kita pergi operation, let's say cut our leg, they will probably put uh, anesthetics, kan? like full anesthetics sampai you KO. The companions last time, after the battle, mana ada anesthetic? You know what they said? Perform operation on me while I'm praying. Because I will not feel anything while I'm praying. For example. Right? So, if there's any lesson at all, and you know, at this point, we'll stop so that you can go back to your office by 2 o'clock. If you want to see, if you want to qualify ourselves to be in Jannah, so we look at examples of those who has been guaranteed Jannah. And we look at how they live their lives. And we look at the kind of morality that they have, the kind of adab they have, the kind of piety, the kind of taqwa, the kind of, uh, you know, what time they wake up for tahajud, how the quality of their prayers, how the quality of their recitation, subhanallah. We cannot match any of these sahaba in terms of ibadah. No one, not including myself, we cannot say that we, inshallah we enter paradise through our ibadah. Cannot. But maybe we can taste the smell of paradise by the love we have for Allah, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the love we have for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the love we have for the companions and the sahaba and try to emulate some of the actions that they perform so that we become nearer in taqwa to them. And the Prophet used to say to a Bedouin who asked him, when is the last day? And he said, and the Prophet said, what do you do? Well, I did the five daily prayers, all the wajib without the sunnah. Bedouin, not sophisticated. And that's all I did. And then, but I love Allah and the Prophet. And so the Prophet responded by saying, I think this is one of the most revolutionary hadith the Prophet said. And to the Bedouin, uneducated, he says, Al-mar'u ma'aman ahab. You will be with the one whom you ahab, whom you love. So if he truly loves the Prophet, he, he said, the Bedouin, hey, I love the Prophet, I love Allah. Inshallah, on the day of judgment, I'll be with him in Jannah. So he left the Prophet happy. Hey, subhanallah, I'm going to be in Jannah. But because if he truly loves and he develops as he matures in his life, and his, in his knowledge, then he learned, he heard, hey, the Prophet performed fasting Monday, Thursday. Hey, the Prophet performed Ba'anja Qabliya. Hey, the Prophet performed Tahajud Kamulal. Do you think he will start doing it? Eventually, he will start doing it. And that is the reason why he will enter Jannah, inshallah. Okay? So, uh, we'll stop here, inshallah. Join us next week as we continue to talk about some of the characteristics of Sayyidina Abu Bakr. And inshallah, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase our love for these people who has been granted paradise. And inshallah, to, to, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy for us to emulate, to follow, so that we can be nearer to taqwa. And may Allah be pleased with all of us, inshallah. I will see you next Wednesday. Let us end by reciting Tasbih Kafara and Surah Al Asr. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika Ashadu ala ilaha ila anta Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wa al-Asri inal insana lafi khusar Ila al-lazina amanu wa amnu salihati Wa tawasa bil haqq wa tawasa bil sabr Sadaqul azim See you next week insha'Allah Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh